I'm John Weber. I'm the executive director of the Jordan Schitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon, and it's a real pleasure to have you here today. Uh, we're here today with Lucille McKenzie, if you could just give a wave, uh, to celebrate and honor the opening, <laughs> the, the reopening and christening of the new Dean, Dean and Lucille McKenzie Gallery, devoted to the study of, of Russian icons. And I'm gonna open with a land acknowledgement and then make just a few comments before welcoming our speaker, Zoe Cambor, who is the curator of the show, the Afterlife, that we're going to be hearing about today. So the University of Oregon and the JSMA are located on the Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the Coast Reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Celeste Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their communities at the UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. We also express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon, and along with the tribes I just named, this includes the Burns Paiute Tribe, the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayuslaw Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquille Indian Tribe, the Cowcrete Band of Umpqua, Umpqua Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. We also res express our respect for all other displaced indigenous peoples who call Oregon home. And a land acknowledgement seems all the more important today as we open a show of historical and traditional Russian and Greek icons at a moment when the government of the present day Russia wages an unpro unprovoked war in the Ukraine. And it is important and in fact crucial to remember and emphasize that at this moment that a people are not synonymous with their government. And that artists and writers across Russia and citizens are protesting that war. I think it's also really important to remember that our museum was founded by Gertrude Bass Warner on the premise that studying art can build bridges of understanding between peoples and people, between one nation and another, and between one culture and another. Really nothing seems more important than that right now. So this is a particularly welcome show to open today. So the museum offers its thanks to Lucille and to her husband, the late Professor Dean McKenzie, for their generous gift supporting this gallery. It is wonderful to have you here today, Lucille. Thank you again. I'm also delighted to introduce uh, Zoe Cambor, the curator of the show we opened today, Afterlife, the Saints of Russian and Greek Orthodoxy. Zoe is our European and American postgraduate curatorial fellow and came to us after finishing an MA in art history here, highly recommended by Professor Miley Hutterer, um, her graduate advisor. Um, Zoe has been a superb colleague and a member of our staff whose energy and insight are on full view in this elegant, carefully curated and researched exhibition. Uh, please join me in thanking Lucille and Zoe and welcoming Zoe to tell us about Afterlife. Thank you so much, John. Hello, everybody. Um, as I said, as John said, I'm Zoe, the postgraduate fellow in European and American art, and I had the privilege of being assigned the reinstallation of our collection of Orthodox icons on my very first day working here. It has been a wonderful collaborative experience with the rest of the staff here at the JSMA, especially because this is the first physical exhibition I have ever curated. I would like to thank a few people for being here today and for their help before I begin. I am delighted that Lucille McKenzie um, was one of the first people to view this exhibition and that she is here today. I am thankful that my parents, Hillary and Michael, my wife, Chloe, my mentor and advisor, Miley Hutterer, and my great friends from the History of Art and Architecture graduate program are in attendance today. I additionally would like to thank David DiLorenzo and the rest of the Knight Library Special Collection staff for loaning two of their manuscript leaves to the exhibition, and as well to Slavic librarian Hegina Hakovayan for her indispensable expertise. I would also like to make an acknowledgement to the Russian-Ukrainian War. 
While the exhibition predominantly features artwork from Russia, it by no means supports the violation of human rights and safety committed by the Russian government. I would like to acknowledge the difficulty of compartmentalizing the artwork within the framework of this larger global issue. Previous exhibitions that feature the icons often spoke of them as objects, their use as tools of divine intercession and as windows to heaven. While the icons are certainly the highlight of the exhibition, I want to expose the public to the humanity expressed in these divine images. My research as an art historian frequently focuses on the personal impact of art on viewers throughout history. So my line of research questions for curating this exhibition similarly focused on religious and per personal reception of the imagery depicted in these featured objects. How did the worshipers view the icons? What kind of religious experience were they hoping to achieve by worshiping through these images? Why were certain subjects more frequently depicted than others? These types of questions led me to the theme of hagiography, the narrative accounts of the lives of saints. Therefore, this exhibition explores the role hagiography played in the creation of religious artwork, the practice of saint veneration, and the tools of divine intercessions through not only icons, but manuscripts and other religious objects as featured in the Metropolitan Museum of Art Cloister Loans. I will begin with a background in what constitutes a saint, how saints are worshipped, and the differences between Western and Eastern Christian Orthodoxy before moving into a walkthrough of all the objects. Christianity is one of many religions that, many religious practices that recognizes saintly figures. The process of sanctification posthumously recognizes the special relationship that an individual had with God during their mortal life. Christian saints also had other supernatural qualities, such as the ability to perform miracles, a willingness to suffer torture and death for their beliefs, and a particular adherence to the pious behavior set by Jesus. One or more of these qualities guaranteed them a privileged place in heaven, and they therefore serve as intercessors between humanity and God post-mortem. After their death or martyrdom, the body, associated objects, religious buildings in their name, and images of the saints were used as tools to facilitate communication with God through the saint. The corporeal remains of saints continue to perform miracles and act as conduits for God's power. The hagiography of a saint played a crucial role in the development of Christianity, particularly during the Middle Ages. The hagiography could inspire an entire set of rules for worship, such as with Saint Benedict and the Benedictine monastic order, or be used as teaching guides for Christian morals. Notable parts of the life of a saint, such as how they died or their secular occupation, supplied the symbols associated with their visual images. Saints are identifiable by the objects they hold, their settings, or what they wear. For example, a reader of this Book of Hours from the late 15th century would be able to identify these three saints. We have Saint Margaret. Um, she is standing on the beast of which she cut herself out of. We have Saint Anthony. Um, he is in a monk's habit, wears a Tau cross that symbolizes his previous life as a pig herder and carries a bell that was used to dispel spirits. And St. Augustine in the middle, who wears a bishop vestment and holds a pierced heart, a symbol of his passionate love for God and his fellow brothers and sisters. These visual symbols, or what art historians call iconography, not only allowed the viewer to identify the saint, but also served as a mnemonic device for recalling and remembering the hagiography and its lessons. Beginning around the end of the 5th century until the Protestant Reformation in 1517, the pious devotion to saints incorporated a variety of objects. The earliest imagery associated with the venerations of saints are icons, holy images that represent Jesus, Mary, Christian saints, or stories from their lives in the increasingly Christian Eastern Roman Empire. Icons became especially important in the Byzantine Empire in the Eastern Mediterranean. Inspired by painted wooden tomb portraits from Egypt, the icon became one of the first tools to aid in Christian intercession. They can be made from a variety of media, including paint, metal, fresco, mosaic, textiles, or even gems. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition, icons are considered windows to heaven and are used as focal points for devotion and as conduits for prayer even today. Like relics, legends tell of the miraculous power of icons to answer prayers, heal the sick, protect warriors in battle, and more. However, the use of icons as a method of worship did not settle well with all Christians. 
In the mid eighth century, iconoclasm, the destruction of icons, swept through the Byzantine Empire under the notion that worshipers were praying not to the saint, Jesus or Mary, but rather to the physical and mortally made image of the being. Regardless of the iconoclasm, icons continued to be used throughout the Byzantine Empire and inter Eastern European Orthodoxy. In contrast, relics became more popular for saint veneration than icons in Western Europe. Relics are the corporeal remains of saints or other objects that came into direct contact with a saint's body. Medieval Christians believed that because the body and soul would reunite at the end of days, that saints in heaven retained a connection to their relics and therefore could help facilitate one's prayers. Relics were typically housed in special containers made of precious metals and gems known as reliquaries, such as the example on the left. Certain relics were renowned for their miraculous powers, such as curing blindness or other ailments, and would be sought out by pilgrims near and far. You may be wondering, what is the difference between Eastern and Western Christian Orthodoxy, aside from their devotional objects, such as these two crucifixes? For those of you who may be familiar with the practices of Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy follows some of the same religious practices, but with certain key differences. As demonstrated in this exhibition, Eastern Orthodoxy places more emphasis on saints as a means of communicating with God on our behalf. Like other non-Catholic sects of Christianity, they do not recognize the Pope as Christ's representative on earth, but rather as the Bishop of Rome with no apostolic succession. Eastern Orthodoxy rejects the concept of original sin that is passed in each generation, beginning with Eve and the apple. And finally, the concept of salvation is achieved through the lifelong effort to leave a holy life and to become closer to God, rather than doing specific acts to earn salvation. The pious acts and hagiography aid in this effort by setting clear as example of a holy life. With all of that background out of the way, let's move on to the exhibition, shall we? In this exhibition, you can access all the information and more that I speak about today, either through the QR code on the introductory panel or the physical exhibition catalog directly below the panel. I'm going to start a walkthrough with the three objects that are in the case first. There are two manuscript leaves from a Russian 18th century book of hagiography, hey graciously on loan to us from the Knight Library Special Collections, and a very small icon. The leaf you currently see on the screen is from the end of the hagiography hey of Saint Herasimus, which describes the famous story of him saving and befriending a lion. The tale goes that one day, um, Herasimus was out fetching water with his donkey when he heard the sounds of an animal in anguish. A lion suddenly emerges out of the bushes and while crying out to Herasimus, offers his paw. Herasimus finds and removes the thorn from the lion's paw, relieving him of his pain. In gratitude, the lion chooses to always remain by Herasimus' side and lives with him and the rest of the monks in the monastery. Herasimus names the lion Leo, and they remain inseparable even when Herasimus passes. In this manuscript leaf, two monks block Leo from entering the structure where Herasimus' soul, represented here as a naked child protruding out of his chest, is being escorted to heaven by an angel. Although Leo is blocked in this depiction, the original tale notes that the devoted lion remained by Herasimus' grave until he too passed. This story may sound really familiar. There is a parallel tale in the hagiography hey of Saint Jerome. The two saints lived concurrently, so it is possible that early in the composition of their hagiography, hey their exploits were confused, especially because Jerome's Latin name is Geronimus. The tale of Herasimus and the lion was widely known throughout the Christian world, so it is possible that the names were confused in the oral retellings of their hagiographies. Hey the next leaf is from a story that may seem appropriative to us now, but it was one of the most popular hagiographies hey of the medieval period. This shows the end of the story of Josephat and Barlam, a Christian retelling of Siddhartha Gautama before he became the Buddha. In the Christian version, Josephat is a prince of an Indian kingdom where his father, Abner, persecutes the Christian church in his realm. Astrologers predict that Josephat will become a Christian, so Abner keeps him locked away. Despite imprisonment, one day he meets an ascetic Christian hermit and saint named Barlam. Saint Barlam convinces Josephat to convert to Christianity and live the ascetic life with him for some time. Upon returning to his kingdom, Josephat converts his entire family and lords to Christianity as well. His father, upon converting, gives the kingdom to Josephat, and Abner becomes a hermit. 
Josephat rules for some time, but eventually desires to find Barlam and live a holy life alongside him. At the end of the tale, shown in this leaf, Josephat decides that he will leave his kingdom and hands it over to one of his lords, Barachie, whom he believes will rule in the same manner as himself. Barachie rules the kingdom in piety, and Josephat finds Barlam in the desert, where they live the rest of their lives as ascetic hermits. In the original version, Siddhartha Gautama was born to a royal family in present-day Nepal, where his privileged life shields him from the sufferings of existence. During his adult life, Siddhartha had various encounters that demonstrated the cruelty and suffering of the world outside of his royal protection. One day, he encounters an Indian monk who encourages him to follow the ascetic lifestyle of self-denial and discipline. After six years of extreme asceticism, Siddhartha sat under a tree and became deeply absorbed in meditation. He achieved enlightenment during this meditative state and became the Buddha. The name Josephat or Yosefat comes from a misreading of the Arabic spelling for bodhisattva, a person who is able to reach nirvana but delays doing so. When in a word, the letters ba and ya are only differentiated by a dot. Therefore, someone read bodhisattva as yodhisattva, leading to Yosefat. The smallest icon in one of our more recent icon, icon acquisitions in the exe exhibition depicts the protection of Theotokos, or the Virgin Mary, over the church of Lechene and the notable saints associated with the church. The figures beginning with the top register, starting from the left, are Jesus, the Virgin Mary with her omophorion, a protective veil, draped over her arms, and two unidentifiable figures hypothesized to be St. John the Evangelist and St. John the Baptist. The three left figures are Bishop Tarasios, St. Andrew the Fool for Christ, and St. Andrew's disciple Epiphanios. The two right figures are Emperor Leo VI the Wise and his fourth wife, Epres Zoe Carbonopsina. The central figure is St. Roman the Melodist. The Church of Lachone was built during the 5th century in Constantinople. The church held the relics of Mary's omophorion and her belt. Miracles surrounding the church and its relics began with St. Roman the Melodist, the central figure, in the 6th century. The hagiography of Roman dictates that in 518, he was tasked with reading verses from the Psalms, but did so poorly that he was humiliated and ridiculed by the clergy. So he prayed all night to the omophorion until he fell asleep. The Virgin Mary came to him in his dream, gave him a scroll, and ordered him to eat it. When he woke in the morning, not only could he recite and sing beautifully, but he also could compose beautiful hymns. However, the most famous miracle surrounding this church, an event that is commemorated with its own feast day in October, is Mary's protection during the siege of Constantinople in the 10th century, instigated by St. Andrew the Fool for Christ. Now, a fool in this context departs from our modern definitions of the term. To be a fool for Christ is a form of asceticism where a person feigns madness in order to mask their sainthood in utter devotion to God. During the siege, it is said that when he prayed, he and his disciple Epiphanius witnessed Mary kneeling down, praying for the Christians under attack, and spreading the omophorion over all the Christians in the temple for protection. St. John the Evangelist and St. John the Baptist were also said to be present alongside Mary. Miraculously, the church of Lachone and its inhabitants remained unharmed. Now, the most curious figures in this icon are Leo VI, Zoe, and Bishop Tarasios. While they are not canonically saints, rulers of Constantinople, like Leo VI and Zoe, were considered from holy descent, which is why they have halos. It is hypothesized that they are present in this icon because they ruled during the 10th century siege of Constantinople. Bishop Tarasios was known for defending the use of icons during the iconoclasm in Byzantium in the 7th century. It is possible that one of the icons he venerably defended, from the, uh, he venerably defended was the original icon of Theotokos of Blacarne. We now move to the larger icons, beginning with this quadripartite icon of four nativities. The four birth stories present on this icon include, clockwise starting from the top left, the nativities of Mary, Jesus, St. Nicholas of Myra, and St. John the Baptist, set in scripturally anachronistic settings. At the left and right are Saints Peter and Elizabeth, who may serve as the patron saints for the owner of the icon. Due to their association with motherhood, icons with nativity scenes were often created in conjunction with childbirth. 
The Nativity of Mary and the Nativity of St. John the Baptist are compositionally and almost chromatically identical. They are both on the left. In the Nativity of Mary, her mother Anne receives gifts from three attendants while her husband Joachim looks on from the upper right. In the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, his mother Elizabeth also receives gifts from three attendants. The only didactic difference between these two scenes is the action of the father of the saint. While Joachim only looks on, St. John's father, Zechariah, writes the name of his son as described in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 63. While St. John's birth is recorded in the New Testament, the birth of Mary is not recorded in the Christian Bible at all. The nativity of Jesus in the top right is the only one in an outdoor setting. Against a jagged, rocky landscape, two scenes occur simultaneously. Above, Jesus lies in a crib within a cave while Mary rests on a mandorla, or full-body halo, like mattress outside. On the other side of the crib, the three magi offer their gifts to the Christ child. To the other side of Mary is the annunciation of the birth of Jesus to a shepherd. Below this scene, starting from the left, Jesus' father, Joseph, hears doubts of the Christ child's holiness from an old shepherd. In the cave to the right, a female figure prepares Jesus for a bath. While the nativity of St. Nicholas is indoors, it is compositionally different from the nativities of Mary and St. John. The holy bishop St. Saint Nicholas of Mira is revered in the Eastern Orthodox Church as the miracle worker and serves as the patron saint of Russia. And yes, this is the St. Nicholas of Santa Claus. Although he left neither theological works nor writings, his hagiography defines his characteristic feature as living not for oneself, but for others. In his nativity, St. Nicholas is carried by a female attendant to his mother Nona in bed, while his father Theophanes looks on. St. Nicholas was miraculously born after the couple had tried to conceive for as much as 30 years. It is said that his first miracle was curing Nona's infertility immediately after being born. This icon contains martyred, former mercenary, and wonder-working saints. It is possible that the collection of saints were the patrons of a family. It would have been placed in the beautiful corner in the home where it would have served as a focal point for prayer. Moving left to right, starting from the bottom row, are Victor of Damascus, Mary Magdalene, Nicholas of Mira, Basil the Great, Lydia of Illyria, Cosmos the Hymnographer. Moving to the middle row, we have the Tsarevich Dimitri, Saint Elizabeth, Hope, and Antonina of Nicaea. And the top row features the Holy Virgin Martyr Valentina and Virgin Martyr Alexandra. At the top of the icon, Christ enthroned blesses the saints. Now, in the exhibition catalog, I have written the hagiographies of all 12 saints in this icon. But for the sake of time, I will only share two. If you would like to know more, I am more than happy to share them after the talk. The first I would like to start with is St. Basil the Great, the Bishop of Pariah, who was an influential theologian and considered the father of communal monasticism. His monastic rules include prayer and contemplation alternated with physical labor, charity to the surrounding community, and educating children, rather than asceticism. Additionally, he composed many liturgies or forms of worship, the most important being his treatise on the Holy Spirit. Saint Tsarevich Dmitri was the youngest son of Tsar Ivan IV, also known as Ivan the Terrible, and he died at the young age of eight under unknown circumstances. Much of the population believed that he was assassinated by his older brother. Shortly after his death, three separate pretenders came forward claiming to be the Tsarevich. In 1606, Dmitri was glorified in the Russian church to stop further impostors from claiming the throne and tarnishing his name. His relics, now in the Archangelus Cathedral in the Kremlin, caused many miraculous healings. Now we move on to the objects on loan to us from the Met Cloisters. You may already be familiar with them since they have been on display since 2020, but I will go over them just in case. The objects in these cases reflect the diverse arts of Christian devotion in Western Europe from the 14th through 16th centuries. The use of costly materials, including ivory and gold-covered copper, to create beautiful objects for religious practice glorified God and the saints. These objects would have been used in churches or in homes for public or private devotion. The copper container, called a reliquary, the second image on the left, um, would have held a relic. The censer, which is second from the right, <clears throat> is shaped like a shrine or church. 
This container for burning incense would have been swung from its chain during religious processions, causing the smoke to waft out of the arched openings. Other objects depicted um, holy figures, such as Jesus and his mother Mary. The owner of the ivory diptych all the way on the right would have held it like a book, using the carved images to remember the stories from Jesus' life. Statues of the Virgin and Child were among the most popular sculptural forms of the late Middle Ages, and the stone and ivory versions shown here represent two different types of this motif. Both sculptures capture the loving relationship between mother and son, emphasizing the humanity of Jesus as well as his divinity. Now we move on to icons depicting singular states, starting with this Russian icon of St. George, the patron saint of Moscow, as well as the patron saint of England, Ethiopia, Catalonia, and about eight more other places. This depiction of him as St. George the Victorious, or St. George slaying the dragon, is one of the most popular subjects in Orthodox icon painting. He is venerated as a military saint, the deliverer of prisoners, protector of the poor, and patron of agriculture, herds, flocks, and shepherds. In this icon, George slays the dragon with a spear topped by a cross. The youth of Mytilini, seated behind George, holds a golden flagon, a drinking vessel typically used for holding wine. At the top left, an angel appears from the, the clouds, holding a wreath of flowers and a palm branch, the symbol of martyrdom. Below, below the angel are two monarchical figures standing on top the battlement of a medieval-like castle tower. The male monarchical figure offers two golden keys to George. At the entrance of the tower, an attendant welcomes George into the castle walls. The legend of St. George slaying the dragon is the most famous part of his hagiography, but it was an 11th century addition to his hagiography from the 5th or 6th century. In his original hagiography, he was a soldier in the Roman army sentenced to death by the Roman emperor Diocletian for refusing to abandon his Christian faith. The legend of him slaying the dragon is set in Silene, Libya around the year 287. In this town, the local pagan inhabitants worshiped a dragon as a deity. In order to prevent incurring the dragon's wrath upon the town, the inhabitants began offering him two sheep per day. When the sheep were not enough for the dragon, the people were forced to sacrifice their children instead. When the time came that the daughter of the local king, Elizabeth, was to be sacrificed, St. George appeared on a white horse. With the words, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, George charged at the dragon. He struck him with a force great enough that he pinned the beast's mouth to the ground where it was trampled by his horse. The king was so grateful to George that he offered his riches to him, but George declined. Instead, he baptized 25,000 people. St. George's writing companion, the youth of Mytilini, only appears in Greek and Russian icons. The youth's rescue originally comes from George's Greek hagiography, but little is known about the youth. The youth of Mytilini was a Christian boy who had been taken from his family and forced to slavery by the Saracens. While he was offering a glass of wine to his masters, he was rescued by St. George and carried home across the Aegean Sea. The 14th century monk, St. Sergius of Radonezh, rivals St. Nicholas as one of the most revered saints in the Russian Orthodox Church. He founded the Monastery of the Holy Trinity, the spiritual center of Russia. The icon shows the miraculous moment when the Virgin Mary and apostles Peter and John visited him and his disciple St. Michae during prayer at the monastery. According to the hagiography, Mary blessed Sergius and told him that his Monastery of the Holy Trinity would flourish. Sergius bows at the feet of the Virgin. His disciple and successor, Saint Nikon, stand directly beside him, while Saint Michae stands in the doorway, covering his eyes with his robe. At the top of the icon is the so-called Old Testament Trinity. The scene depicts a scene from the book of Genesis, where three angels visited Abraham under the, book, under the oak of Mamre. We now move to the final two objects, the icons from Greece. This icon shows Saint Chrysanthus, a saint who converted from paganism to Christianity in his early adult life and with his wife Daria converted many other Romans in his lifetime. His hagiography states that in attempt to coax his son back to paganism, Chrysanthus' father arranged a marriage to virgin Roman priestess of Minerva, Saint Daria. However, Chrysanthus converted his wife to Christianity and they lived celibate lives. 
The pair went on to convert a number of Romans, much to the chagrin of the pagan community in Rome, who subsequently complained to the Roman elected official Claudius. Upon learning of their conversions, Claudius had Chrysanthus arrested and tortured. Chrysanthus remained so faithful to God under torture that it inspired Claudius to convert his family and 70 of his soldiers to Christianity. When the news of Claudius's conversion reached em Roman Emperor Numerian, he executed Claudius, his family, and the 70 Roman soldiers. While there remains debate about the torture leading to their execution, Numerian eventually had Saints Chrysanthus and Daria buried alive. In this icon, Chrysanthus is atypically without his wife. Most icons and other artistic depictions feature both he and Daria. An angel crowns Chrysanthus with a floral wreath in one, with one hand and holds a palm branch in his other, as does Chrysanthus. As said before, saints depicted holding palm branches signal that they were martyred, representing the victory of spirit over flesh. Finally, we have an icon of Saint Simeon the Stylite. Saint Simeon is the founder of stylitism, a form of ascetic life that consists of remaining upright or kneeling on top of a column or pillar on which was constructed a narrow roofless habitation. The stylite lived there and was never able to lie at full length or have any protection from the elements. In this icon, Saint Simeon's head and torso are visible atop the pillar with the Virgin Mary reinforcing his sanctity on one side and the devil disguised as a lion on the other. St. Simeon lived upright on the column for 37 years until his death. St. Simeon lived a life of extreme asceticism within a Syrian monastery before he lived atop a column. Upon first living, leaving the monastery, he shut himself in an enclosure where he remained standing, fasting, and praying. His sanctity, cures, and other miracles produced by his prayer made his remote enclosure a pilgrim destination. In order to preserve his solitude without giving up his... Um, without giving up providing for the needs of his disciples and visitors, St. Simeon ascended a column where he remained upright for 37 years until his death in 459. His hagiography was written during his lifetime and stylitism became a common sight throughout the Christian Levant. Thank you so much for this talk. I am um, delighted to introduce our final speaker, Hegina Hakovayan, who is the Slavic librarian at the University of Oregon, who was paramount in uh, helping me translate some of the icons. And she will talk to you today about Old Church Slavonic and her translation process. Hegina. I wanted to start uh, with uh, the uh, importance of the language in the history of human, human beings. So, and to quote Antoine de Rivarol, who said, the person who created the alphabet has provided us with the threads of our thoughts and the key to nature. So, so this alphabet provided beautiful thoughts to Zoe in the process of her interpretation and preparation of this exhibition. So I have the, um, uh, the, the image of Nestor, uh, the chronicler, who actually just um, is connected with um, uh, describing or starting the historical development of Russia and Russian language. So historical uh, development of Russian can be looked into these uh, certain periods. The common East Slavic, Old Russian language, which was written in 11th, 14th centuries. Language of Great Russia, Great Rus, Velika Rus, written in 15th and 16th centuries. Russian national language, beginning of the 17th, uh, in the 17th at beginning of the 19th century. And modern Russian, which starts from Alexander Pushkin to the present day. So the beginning of Russian alphabet, the contribution to Russian alphabet, is connected with the names of Cyril and Methodius. So Kiri in Mifoji. On May 24, 1863, in the city of Pliska, the capital, former capital of Bulgaria, 
Um, the brothers Cyril and Methodius announced the invention of the Slavic alphabet. And believe it or not, nowadays, uh, May 24th is celebrated and observed by Russians as the day of the alphabet. So uh, then historically, uh, the baptism of Russia happened, which happened in 1988, and connected with the baptism of Russia, handwritten books in the old Slavonic language appeared in Russia. They were brought from Byzantium and Bulgaria. So when the, uh, the time goes on, the flows, we know that very well, old Russian books began to be created, written according to old Slavonic models. So again, in the process of this evolutionary development, Russian people started using the alphabet taken from the southeastern Slavs created by Kirill and Mifoji in business correspondence as well. So they started corresponding and writing in uh, old Slavonic language. In ancient Russia, two alphabets were known but mainly the Cyrillic alphabet was used. It was the Cyrillic alphabet that was used to write the monuments of the old Russian language. Cyrillic letters denoted not only speech sounds, but also numbers. So only uh, Peter, under Peter the Great, uh, or uh, known also Piotr Pierwi, Piotr Veliki, Peter the First, Arabic numerals were introduced to denote numbers. So, uh, Cyrillic alphabet during Peter the Great started uh, undergoing some reforms and um, um, uh, 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 these reforms, uh, they formed the basis of Russian and some other Slavic uh, alphabets, the Cyrillic alphabet. As a result of the first reform of the Russian alphabet, the civil alphabet was born. Even nowadays, Old Slavonic Russian and Old Russian is used in churches. So uh, uh, during, before Peter the First, the language uh, uh, was considered as church language. But Peter the Great started just uh, uh, promoting and, uh, uh, and um, uh, use, uh, uh, turning it into the civil alphabet, to the language of the uh, usual human beings. And in this connection with the civil alphabet, the first Russian grammar book appeared appeared, Rasiska Grammatica. It was actually uh, created and compiled by Mikhail Lomonosov. Um, he gave the literary language its final form by merging Russian and old Slavic elements, Slavonic elements. So still the reforms and the changes are going on and uh, interesting fact that on November 18, 1783, some Russian scholars or linguists call it the birth of letter Yo. So on November 18, the princess Ekaterina Romanovna Varantsova-Dashkova proposed uh, introduction of a new letter into the alphabet. The letter Yo is the E with two dots on top. This idea was picked up by Nikolai Karamzin, a historian, writer, poet, and critic. With his approval and light hand, the letter became part of the Russian alphabet. So in 1918, uh, another reform happened connected with the Russian language. So the changes in the alphabet were those. Letters uh, yat, fita, and a decimal, dissetirichnaya, were removed and replaced by the contemporary e, 
fair e the hard sign till this knock was cancelled at the end of the words so the ijit said the last letter over there itself disappeared from the alphabet even before the reforms so and actually i discovered that there is a monument in the city of ulyanovsk it's a city on river uh, volga uh, dedicated to the ancient or vanished letters of old Russian alphabet. So, and these letters again are Yats, Fita, and Decimal, Dishitichne. So, um, here, let's look into Kirillica again. It is an alphabet, Slavonic alphabet. Many, many Slavic languages are uh, their alphabet. Their ABC is based on this creation. And it, uh, 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 it, it shows that it consists of 43 letters. So in the development and evolution and improvement of the russian language the alphabet contemporary alphabet consists 33 letters so the interesting process connected with this um, uh, with this um, uh, research or preparation of the exhibition are connected with reading these tiny, mini, mini, little signs, as you see here. And they are written on old Slavonic language. So this language is taught only in Russian universities, uh, the linguistic departments or the literary studies. It's not live, it's just the Latin language, right? Uh, almost. Uh, so, uh, but it's still live in churches. Um, uh, um, so while I was trying to le read these uh, uh, the, uh, uh, these puzzles for me, because every day I wasn't connected, though I studied old Russian language in the University of Tumen uh, in Russia, uh, I actually uh, got the uh, consultations and help from uh, uh, scholars and professors like Tamara Yusmunova, Morris, she's connected with our Russian, East European and Eurasian studies, and Mikhail Alexeyevich Chernov, who is a professor at the Moscow State University. So when we were reading this, uh, we just uh, uh, found out that it's the um, uh, it's the sign over here that says Keli Manastirsky, which are the monastic um, uh, cells. And uh, uh, it says over here, oh my God, go back. How can I go back? Okay, I'm back. <laughs> so um, over here, I better show here. It says that it's a Pristavisha Svitova Gerasima. So uh, that's uh, the, the time when he, is, uh, he passed away. And over here, it's very, very interesting. At the beginning, when Zoe and I were looking at this artifact, so I don't know, you can get closer or you can go upstairs and look. This is very strange animal, more resembling to me, and I can be completely wrong, and please forgive me, more resembling a dog than a lion. Yeah, but we know it's a lion, and even the uh, script over here, the, 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 the writing says, so, Lev Isha Pripadobnova Gerasima. So is the lion looking for the blessed or the saint Gerasima? Uh, so this was a very interesting way of uh, just uh, trying to interpret and to connect, uh, uh, to find the story behind this artifact. The next was, oh, Zoe already wonderfully told you about everything. I will just say what we read here. So it's Piridacha. Tsarstva Iosafam. So it's the transover of the kingdom by Josephat. And um, 
So over here, over there, it says Tsarsky Balade. So the palace of the Tsar or the king, okay? So th that, that's what we were re reading. As Zoe mentioned, this was a very small icon a beautiful, a treasure you will enjoy, and it, it, it just creates such a solemn atmosphere around it. But it was interesting that all this, uh, uh, yeah, we were speaking, you saw the old Slavonic alphabet, the Cyrillic alphabet, but trust me, to read this, it's more than Cyrillic alphabet. It is just because it's just handwritten by, uh, I don't know, by the creator of the icon. And definitely they were not using the calligraphy or anything like that. So it is interesting. It, 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 this process reminded me a little like investigative linguistics. Uh -huh. So uh, then uh, we just um, established that this is a Bagamati. I will read just the Russian for you to hear the Russian language. The Svitaya Tsarevna Zoya. So this is the Tsarevna uh, Zoya. Then next to her is Svitoy Tsarlev. Then uh, there is this center figure, which was very, very interesting. Just look at that. It was just interesting to figure out that is the, uh, 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 it's written as Raman. Sladka uh, Pilet. So, and then, of course, Zoe wonderfully uh, gave you the background and the story connected with these uh, uh, creatures. Then I'm going to speak about this uh, two. Um, uh, reading their signs was very, very interesting. So the holy fool, Andrei Yurodzivy, and of course his pupil, Epiphany, the sign was very interesting and easy to be read. Uh, so these are the excerpts from that. And finally, just working with this script with the old Slavic, and again, by no means, I am not a researcher in this area. I was just a reader. I just discovered this poem by Ivan Bunin. So with your permission, I will read it in Russian. You can just follow. The translation is not mine. You see the link. Uh, but it's just very interesting way of uh, just saying, OK. <clears throat> Word, slova, молчат гробницы, мумии и кости, лишь слову жизнь дана, из древней тьмы на мировом погосте звучат лишь письмена. И нет у нас иного достояния, умейте же беречь, хоть в меру сил, в дни злобы и страдания, наш дар бессмертный речь. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agina. Um, and now at this time, I will take questions if anybody has any. Yes. Well, I guess this question relates to the previous speaker, but it did strike me that in the development of the Russian alphabet, in 1918, certain reforms occurred. And I wondered if those had any relationship to the political development. Yes, definitely. Hegina, would you like to speak about that? Yes. Uh, what was the question? Could you kind of uh, Yes, in the 1918 reforms, I wondered if they were related to uh, the political developments of that time. Uh, uh, definitely it was just a time after the revolution mm -hmm. where everything has to be just rewritten, renovated and everything. But at the same time, it's the process of the development of the language. Oh. Yeah, like that at the end, the hard sign which still exists in Russian language made no sense. Of course it dropped out. Okay. Then Egypt, the letter, it just was, it vanished from the alphabet or from the usage of the language itself. So it's not only the 
revolutionary changes in the government and everything. But I will say it's the development of the language. And remember the first Russian grammar when I said Momonosov, a scientist, he just combined the old Russian or the existing Russian and the Slavonic elements together. Is this a good answer to you? Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. In uh, your introductory remarks, you used several uh, past tense words mm -hmm. that suggested that the, the use of icons in the Orthodox Church were was past. It was, it was a historical investigation. And I'm, I'm wondering about that because there's certainly lots of practicing Orthodox people. Yeah, and, and icons are still used by both Russians and Greeks. My, my Greek grandmother had a couple of icons of her own in her house. Um, but a great amount of the icons in Russia, at least, were destroyed or smuggled out of Russia um, during the rise of the USSR because they just completely banned the Orthodox religion, period. And so we saw a large movement of icons and just straight up destruction of them in general. So while people are definitely still using them today, they're perhaps not used as quite as much as they used to be. So I think it's, it's more relatively rare to find the beautiful corner in a house, which would have had at least eight different icons in it. And it was like a sole focal point prayer. So they're still used, but just not as much given governmental circumstances. Yes. What about the contemporary production of icons? Yeah. In a traditional mode. Yeah, there is one um, icon painter who we've had on display here at the JSMA, um, Olga. I blank. Hi! <laughs> She's right there! Um, and she currently paints uh, icons and, you know, she mixes it with the style she was traditionally taught in with her own contemporary style. Um, and I can't say for sure because a lot of my research was historic and I was focusing more on the pre-20th century. Um, but I believe icons are still in production today using pretty traditional methods. Yeah. yeah. If you would like to add anything. I can't think of today. Well, yes, because religion is there. Definitely. Oh, can you go to the microphone? Okay. <laughs> Hi. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too. So icons are, yes, a lot of new icon schools started probably uh, starting like in the late 80s when Soviet Union started to collapse. I went to the icon school, it was like 19... 91, and it was only like first school in my hometown, which is north of Moscow, about two hours. But a uh, person I was studying with, he was like secretly religious, and he was doing it already for at least 10 years. So um, it was, I think, before that time, it was only like four places in Russia who were still producing icons during Soviet times, few monasteries. So technique was not completely lost. So we were collecting knowledge piece by piece from old masters. And it was like that time nobody would really tell you anything. Everything was so secretive. <laughs> so, so we had to kind of rediscover everything from scratch. But right now it's like a lot of schools because um, you have to understand, like, churches, even they were not destroyed, like, everything inside of them was stripped away. So there was no icons. And I used to work um, at the museum in my hometown as a restorer. For example, we had huge icons that we were restoring. They were used for at least, like, 60 years in the carpentry shops as the tables. 
just to explain you how strong that um, technique is. So basically that pigment, like egg tempera, so it's made from egg and minerals. But minerals, it's like grounded stones. So, and egg is uh, what, like in oil painting, you use oil. That's e instead of oil, you, you use egg. So it just glues the pigment together. So when it dries and over time, it's become like thin layer of stone again. So, and so you understand that like, people were like sewing with the hard tools on top of that, and they were fine. <laughs> yeah, I was like really, that was a miracle. I mean, I love the art side of icons. <laughs> and there are millions of them, new ones, producing constantly. And you can find a lot about technique. A, lo a lot of books are written since then. But it was interesting to be part of that whole revival movement. Thank so. you so much. <laughs> yes. Who was painting the icons at the, at the time? Was there any commonality in terms of known painters who were painting them, or they were monks? They they were monks, and most of them were. were they didn't want to assign a, a name to it because part of it, there was, so they were trying, the way that icons started being painted in Russia was that they were really trying to evoke exactly how the monks in Byzantium um, painted them. And so in Byzantium, they didn't sign their work or anything like that because they thought that was taking it, they were taking the sacredness away by assigning somebody mortal who made it, they wanted it to keep it sacred. So while there were, there were some um, icons I show that have different schools, there was a Mstera school, um, but most of the icons, you know, were, their styles developed regionally, but it was never by the hand of one artist or something like that, otherwise they remained anonymous. Yes? Did you think of the structure, were they all you know, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I definitely know that they were commissioned by the aristocracy. For example, the um, this small icon um, was commissioned or given to a member of the royal Russian family, um, or she was like a like like in higher society, um, but. Most likely, an average person wouldn't be able to afford them, or they would have to spend a lot of their money um, in order to obtain one. So they mostly, um, because the monks were working in the monasteries, they would provide the icons straight to the churches to whom they were, whom they belonged to. Yes. Um, just a question about the, um, the reliability as a historical record. Hmm. That, that particular icon is showing the is the uh, siege of Constantinople in the 10th century. But uh, that was the siege of the, uh, of the Rus, the Swedish Vikings, who attacked uh, Constantinople in 907. Hmm. And they were the Rus. They later became the czars of Russia. So the barbarian heathens that were attacking there are the ones that later came to send the Europe. <laughs> and the, the Leo the Sixth down to the right, his wife Zoe, I guess that's her name. <laughs> she was his third wife. Yeah. Uh, his first two he had, I think, killed. One of them died from childbirth, I believe, but the other one, yes, he had killed. He couldn't get a male heir. Right. So he, he took this concubine and wouldn't marry her until he had an actual heir, mm -hmm. and then the church said this was not. Legal. Right. And so he fired all the uh, and now she's wearing this crown. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, I think there's the historical record can be used for propaganda. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, the way that people have used St. George, for example, for propaganda, I mean, the, there are many, many wars were done in the name of St. George. And in and St. James as well, like in the 14th century in Spain, 
um, St. James was evoked during, you know, the Reconquista. Um, and so people definitely use these hagiographies, which, you know, some of them may be highly embellished. They're, they absolutely use them for propaganda. That's something that you not only see in Eastern Europe, but all over, you know, Western Europe and throughout the Middle Ages. But yeah. Thank you for sharing the rest of that history with us that I didn't get to touch upon. <laughs> Yeah, so in the 19th century, the style began to change and people became, um, they started to become more influenced by the realism movements that were starting in Europe. Um, and so they started incorporating that into their icons, particularly in Moscow schools, um, while other parts of Russia um, retained the more traditional um, style of Russian icons. But this, this kind of signals a small turning point in that they were changing their style a little bit. Um, if you have any further questions, I will be available afterward, but please enjoy the exhibition and thank you all so much for being here.